this is just a little extra stuff to show you if you are still struggling with some relative age dating stuff. Now, of course, if we were in class, I would hand these out and work through these together. Of course, you can't do that. Basically, they were used to introduce you to some of the concepts that we use to determine relative age. So in these first two diagrams, the top one, all we want to illustrate is that if this is a side view, so remember we're looking at a, what we call a cross cut. So we basically sliced into the earth here. Think of it like a, a cake. We've sliced into the cake and we're looking at the side of the cake and there's layers in the cake. That beautiful little cactus is the top. And so if we assume that all of these layers here are sedimentary rocks, so I know we haven't really gotten into the rocks yet, so there are three types, right? Igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. The way that sedimentary rocks are deposited in general is that they are washed in, so material is eroded away from existing rocks. That material gets washed down a slope and deposited into a low-lying area. And those little fragments can get buried, and those fragments can get cemented together, and that would create a sedimentary rock. So if that's true, and all these are sedimentary, in order to get the stack that you see at the top, we would have to deposit D first, because we wash in that material and it gets deposited in some low-lying area. And before I can uh, put B on it, I had to have D there. And then B would get washed in, then E, then A, then C. And so the relative age of the units that you see here would be D, the oldest, and then B would come on top of that, then E, then A, and then C. And we do that because we know how sedimentary rocks are created or deposited. And it'd be just like your cake. If you're going to build your cake and stack it up with a bunch of layers, you have to put the bottom layer on first. And so this is what we call superposition. And it's the idea that the oldest sedimentary rock on the, is on the bottom and the youngest would be at the top. So for the second diagram, all we've done is added an additional feature, which is a fault. And uh, this is related to an earthquake. So sometimes when earthquakes happen, we get a breakage in the rock that extends all the way to the surface. That's what this fault C is illustrating. But we can put this in order also of an event that happened. When did the fault occur? Well, because the fault cuts every single layer that's involved here, I can't cut the layer until it exists. So that would mean that it is the last thing that happened here. So if you were asked to put this in order, you would say, well, because these are all sedimentary rocks, and we're going to say they are unless otherwise indicated, that would mean that the oldest should be on the bottom. So it should be B, then D, then A, F, E, and the last thing would be fault C. So we have a relative age of when things occurred based on superposition, right? The order stack, old on the bottom, and what's called a cross-cutting relationship. Because it cuts everything, then everything had to be there to be cut. And that's kind of the story with cross-cutting relationships. So then we could look at our next diagram here. And so all we're introducing in this diagram at the top is that cross-cutting relationships apply to anything that cuts across the layers. So something you would see in a rock record would be a fault, like we just saw, or an igneous rock, which is represented by B. And this is because igneous rocks that are in the subsurface are molten at some point, and because they are hot and molten, they can move through existing rock layers. Usually they follow a weakness in the rock, maybe an old fault or a fracture or a crack. But the idea is that the hot molten rock is oozing toward the surface, following some weakness in the rock. And of course it's melting the rock as it touches it, incorporating it into the melt as it moves along the layers here. So it is still a cross-cutting relationship, and the idea would be if we were to figure out the relative age of everything here, we'd still use superposition, A, D, E, F, C, and then B happened is the last and youngest thing that occurred because it cuts through everything.
And this little reddish zone here is what's called a bake zone. It's another way to determine that the units were cut by this. Because, of course, the units are there and they didn't get molten, turned into molten rock and incorporated in the melt. They would be baked from the high heat. So still cross-cutting, but igneous rocks can do that too. In this bottom layer, it doesn't have to be a lovely little uh, linear feature. It can be just a blob of stuff that oozed up in there. The shapes are irrelevant. It's really, what is it cutting? So we're still looking at a cross-cutting relationship. And I know that the layers were here first and then B oozed up into here for two reasons. One is there's a bake zone, which tells me that all of these layers are baked, so they all had to be there to be baked. But maybe in the field, the bake zone's hard to see. But here I have little pieces, what are called inclusions. There's a piece of D, F, E, A, and C, all in this blob of igneous rock. And all that means is that this unit, this molten rock, entered into these layers that already existed. It incorporated them in it and it melted a lot of it. But maybe toward the end of its life, it wasn't hot enough to melt everything. And there's a few fragments or inclusions. They suggest that if I have a piece of C in B, then C had to be there so I could grab a piece of it and include it in. So this is another tool we can use, this inclusions idea, to help us figure out the age. So still it's D, F, E, A, C, and then B. And so that would be the order for something like that. Some other things just to think about in this layer up top here, sometimes everything isn't horizontal. If all of these are sedimentary rocks, we would argue, well, we just use superposition. But how do we determine which is the oldest when they're tilted? So the rule is that typically what we would do is we would rotate it back to flat and we'd rotate it in the shortest degree direction, if that makes sense. So the idea is that this layer here would probably rotate down this way, which would make F on the bottom. And that's typically the answer because it's rare that layers get flipped completely over. So the idea is that if J was on the bottom, it would have to flip all the way up to 90 and go beyond 90. That's rare in the geologic record for that to happen, maybe during an impact event. But usually rocks get tilted from uplift or from faulting or earthquakes, but not so severely that they go beyond 90. So we're going to play the odds here and say that if we flip this stack up, to the right that would put F on the bottom and then we would just say well if that's true then F has to be the oldest it's F B D G I E J and then look there was some event that took these flat lying rocks and uplifted them so collisions of plates and all that kind of stuff has the ability to do that so we can uplift and tilt these layers in the process they become a very high area. Remember early on I said that sedimentary rocks are deposited in low areas. Things get washed in and deposited in these basins. Well, if this area gets uplifted, it is no longer a basin. So we don't deposit anymore. So there's no record. What we're doing actually is we're wearing down this high area that I've uplifted. And that would form an erosional event here that's represented by this line which if you watch the other little videos, it'll it's referring to what's called an unconformity, where there's no depositing, it's just removing. And so we wear down this uplifted area till it's low again, and then we can deposit sedimentary rocks again. And so then after that break, we deposit A, C, H, right? So the order F, B, D, G, I, E, J, A, C, H would be the correct order for the sequence. And of course, we could include an erosional event in there if we so choose. So here we've added a few other things. Remember, cross-cutting, orders, all that stuff still plays. And so we want to say that, okay, D cuts through B, G, and A, and a little bit of F. So that would mean that at least those had to be there before D. So how do I know if E was there? 
Well, in this sequence, there's a fault, but it's been overcut or crosscut by this intrusion of molten material. So that would mean if I had to decide which came first, this molten rock or this fault here, we would argue that the fault was here first and then this blob came over and cut across it. We're using cross-cutting relationship to figure out which is older. So fault C is older than D. And if C must have cut through everything, then everything had to be there before C. Well, and that, so that would mean the order for this sequence had to be B, G, A, F, E. Then there was a fault that cut everything. And the youngest thing is this intrusion of molten rock that came in and cut across C and these units here and bake them. Even though it doesn't directly affect E, I can figure out the order because of C and D and their relationship. So the order would be B, G, A, F, E, then fault C, and then D. All right, and then the last sequence, just to give you some other information, looks pretty simple. We have a stack of rocks, but we have a molten rock here with a bake zone on the bottom here. And this one below it looks identical, except it has a bake zone on the top and the bottom. So what's the difference? Okay, so it tells us two different events here. The idea of the bake zone, remember, is to tell us that if the rock is baked from the igneous rock, then the rock had to be there. So if I am baking B, when E is being deposited, B had to be there. But if there's no bake zone on A, it means A did not exist. So when I look at this, we would argue that this layer is probably a lava flow that made it to the surface and flowed along the surface. Then it was subsequently buried by other rock. So look, the order would be D gets deposited, then B, and then somewhere out of this diagram, there's some material that oozes up through a weakness in the rock, makes it to the surface, flows along and covers B, bakes it in the process, and then E crystallizes and cools. And then over long periods of time, we wash in new material, fragments that cover E, more material, more material, we bury it and we turn these into rocks, sedimentary rocks. And so then after E comes A and C. It's just really a stack from old to young. And so we argue that rocks that get deposited that are igneous like a lava flow, we almost treat them just like sedimentary rocks. How do we differentiate between this and this? Because A has been baked, it suggests that A was there when this was deposited, when it oozed here. What does that mean? Well, it means that the order changes. D, B, A, and then E has oozed in between the rock layers. So same thing, maybe somewhere off here, we have a fracture, it's oozing up, it's oozing up, and then the weakness isn't there anymore that's going vertically, but there's a weakness between the layers that it exploits and it goes horizontally now. And it cuts in between these two layers, it melts some of the material there, it oozes along and it bakes both A and B. Okay, and so the order would have to be D, B, A, E. Now, what about C? Well, it could be that D, B, A, then we ooze in some material E, and then later on C gets deposited. Well, that is a reasonable interpretation of what we see here. But because there's no direct relationship between E and C, another possibility could be that D happened, then B, then A, then C, and the last thing was that E oozed in there. From this diagram, I couldn't tell which was the case, and so either would be possible. And we'll run into that sometimes when we look at these little diagrams, that there sometimes are multiple answers given the information that we have in front of us. Some things are absolute, have to be that way, 
but there'll be a few things that we would argue are um, up to debate, right? We can say that either one is correct given that data, and if you run into that, don't stress out. You just put the one that you like, and that would be the correct answer. All right, so hopefully this is uh, helpful for understanding some of the basics. I'm going to do another little video uh, bringing in some of the uh, absolute age dating stuff you can take a look at.